Okay, we are recording, so we're ready to go. Are you ready, Bob? I'm ready, Rod. Let's do it. Then let's do it. Good afternoon. Good morning. This is Rod Santo Massimo with the Massimo Group. And I am so pumped to have our very special guest, Mr. Bob Knackle, Chairman of Investments for New York for JLL. Close friend. Yes, I'll be, I'll be completely I'll be very transparent. He's a client of the Massimo Group. In fact, he is the only individual in the world that I personally coach and have for several years now. Beyond our thousands of folks we worked with and the hundreds of clients we have today, he's the only one that I, I work with. And I'm, 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 so it's an honor every morning. We did it this morning, as a matter of fact, to get on the phone and talk about his business. But today, it's not about necessarily what I'm doing and what we're doing. It's about what the market's doing, because there's some things going on. And how do you adjust? How do you shift when the market shifts? So before we get there, Bob, the floor is yours. Can you share with our audience who may not know of you or aware of you a little about yourself? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, I am a commercial real estate broker that sells buildings in New York City. Uh, I've been doing this for, for over 35 years. I uh, feel very fortunate that uh, I'm able to do this. I absolutely love it. And uh, I am 57 now, but have absolutely no plans on retiring. This fortunately is a business I don't think you ever have to retire from, but uh, I'll take you back quickly to uh, my beginnings in the business, which happened completely uh, serendipitously. Uh, 1981, I'm a freshman at the Wharton School, wanted to be the next Gordon Gecko like every other Wharton kid. Um, went, drove around northern New Jersey where I grew up over my spring break that year looking for a banking job that would look good on my resume. Uh, came out of a Payne Weber office, and across the hall, I saw a Coldwell banker. I walked in thinking it was a bank, dropped my resume off. Uh, they called me later that day to set up an interview. Uh, I set up the interview. This was 1981. There was no internet at the time, so I go to the library the next morning to look up this bank. When I saw it was a real estate company, I almost didn't go on the interview. As it turns out, they were the only ones hiring college kids for the summer. Took the job. Absolutely loved it. Uh, went back my next two summers and then started with CD here in Manhattan when I got out of school in 84. Um, I worked at CD, uh, met my, uh, my partner, Paul Massey, uh, there. Uh, in November of 1988, we started our own firm, Massey Knackle, uh, which uh, we ran for 26 years and 46 days before we sold it to Cushion and Wakefield uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, we had a very unique approach to the business. We divided the city up into geographic territories, put a senior broker in each one of those areas. The thought was uh, to differentiate ourselves from other people, uh, create a competitive advantage by having really granular local market knowledge. Uh, we started in 88 with just the two of us, uh, grew it to 250 people in four offices all in New York. Uh, from 2001, when CoStar started um, tracking the market here, um, we were the uh, number one company in terms of number of properties sold. Uh, we held on to that position through 2014, uh, and over that time, uh, had sold three times the number of properties in New York City as the number two firm, uh, and that uh, continued in the three years uh, post Massey Nackle at Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, my contract with Cushman came up in the middle of 2018, uh, and now I've been at JLL since, and uh, very excited to be with my new partners here uh, and the uh, my even newer partners that came over in the HFF acquisition. So I sit in New York uh, at 42nd and Madison, and um, every day I get up wanting to sell more properties and uh, absolutely love the business and feel very um, very fortunate to have been working with Rod. I think, Rod, we started working together in 2011 or so, and uh, it has uh, really been just a great, great thing for me, um, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of, of working with Rod and his company. So uh, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell, I think. Okay, well, that's a, that's a rather, I mean, besides all the accolades and awards and recognition you've won, I greatly appreciate you being here. And we're going we're gonna to get the end, I promise you, at the end, I want to get to all your questions. Type your questions in the Q&A box. 
not in the chat box. I know they're a little different, a little confusing. Make sure your questions are in the Q&A box and we'll get to all your questions. But I commit to you, if you stay on to the end, like always with all our stuff, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to actually meet with me and Bob and work with me and share a little with Bob as well uh, later on this year. So if that's interesting to you, hold on. I'll give you some ways you can do that. So let's get started. And again, question and answers in the Q&A box, we'll get to them all. But we're talking about market shifts and adapting to market shifts. Now, before we get into this, well, I don't even say it. It was almost a, a seismic shift in New York City with rent regulation that's going on right now and how you're adapting. Let's go back because we got people on this phone for 40 years, 25 years. Some of you aren't even aware of some of the shifts that have happened. And if you thought 2008, for example, to 9, 10 was a life-changing event, there were other life-changing events before then for Bob and myself. So take your way back in 1987, my first job ever in 87, was working for a consult, working on the, the floor of Kleinwerk Benson, a European stock exchange company. So I was there in October of 1987. Some of you know what that means. So Bob, I guess if you start in 84, the first shift you saw was in 87. Just take us back to that. What happened? What happened to the market? And how did you adapt? Sure, absolutely. Well, it, interestingly, the, the stock market did crash in October of 1987, but uh, this was long before uh, technology was as um, prevalent as it is today. So while the stock market had a very significant disruption in October of 87, the real estate market uh, for the balance of 87, 1988, and most of 89 was still pretty good. Um, the, uh, the tough times in the commercial real estate sector really didn't start until 1990. And in 1990 and 1991, uh, the volume of sales just really um, dried up very, very significantly. Um, we saw a diminution in value, which was more significant than even what we saw during the Great Recession. Um, we, uh, we saw values drop 58% on average. Um, in the during the SNL crisis in the early 90s, that's on a price per square foot basis. There were buildings that uh, I sold, apartment buildings that were sold for co-op conversion uh, back in the uh, the mid to late 80s that we sold for 10 and 12 times the rent, which is a, a rent multiple was used as the the metric to purchase apartment buildings back then. Uh, and those same buildings we were selling in 1991 and 1992 at two and three times the rent. Uh, it really was a very, very uh, challenging time. And in fact, 1992, I, I remember as being the year in which the RTC started to uh, sell properties and they were selling them by the hundreds seemingly. Um, and it was the only time I can remember in New York where the supply of available properties exceeded the demand to buy those properties. Um, and it really was a tough time and the market really didn't start coming out of that downturn uh, until 1993. So how did we, we deal with it at that time? Uh, there were so many foreclosures going on that we knew that the banks were going to be major players. Um, they were taking back so many properties and then even the banks were so overwhelmed with the the stresses in the market that many of them failed. And that's when the RTC stepped in and was, uh, was forcing the sale of properties off bank balance sheets. Um, and so uh, we adjusted our practice to uh, try to bring the institutional approach to selling properties that we learned at CB uh, into the smaller market. Uh, the bank seemed to like that. We had uh, as a differentiator, we were only representing sellers, uh, not representing buyers and sellers, um, and uh, only working on exclusives. Uh, the banks seemed to like that because they knew that uh, we would have their best interest in mind. And so um, the first time that, that our company really got a, uh, a bump was representing a lot of banks in the sale of foreclosed properties. Uh, during that period in late 92 and 1993 uh, when things really started to flow into the market. So 
I know the, the call to action back then, so we're gonna date ourselves here, Bob, was stay alive to 95. So the way you stayed alive on the, on the investment side was to forge those relationships with the banks and with the folks from the RTC and start creating some level of velocity that way? Absolutely. I mean, we, we had no reason because we didn't do mortgage brokerage. We only did sales. We had no reason to be talking to banks before that. Uh, but we saw what was happening and every bank was forming an REO department and we were calling every bank in town asking for the, the names of the folks who were running that REO department and the people in those departments. Uh, and most of those people were uh, lenders at a different bank before they got laid off and then went to a different bank to join the REO department to work out a lot of these problems. Uh, but we developed a very substantial list of uh, people in REO departments of banks. And that was the, the majority of our prospecting at that time was calling on those bankers, trying to get in and help them get properties off their books. Well, Bob, I'm laughing because I just realized how old we are because one of the questions that came in and just is how old we are, Bob, was what the heck is the RTC? So, <laughs> the, the, yeah, so the R RTC. Can you, in, in 30 uh, seconds or less, 30 seconds or less, what is the RTC? It was a, an entity called the Resolution Trust Corporation that was formed by the government to go in uh, and basically take over failed banks, uh, dispose of all their assets, uh, they were selling assets for pennies on the dollar, um, and they they were that that entity was formed to clean up the banking problems, and that's why we refer to that recession in the early '90s as the SNL crisis, the savings and loan crisis, because many of the the savings and loan banks did not come out of that recession. They they failed during it, and the RTC was formed to deal with the uh, the many issues that those banks had at the time. Uh, absolutely uh, true. And so if you're in leasing, tenant rep, I will share with you back when I, back in those years, I had my own firm in Tampa, Florida, and we did a significant campaign and a good amount of business really focusing on early renewals, right? Renegotiation, everything. Because the landlords were willing to do anything they could to hold on to a tenant, no matter how much they were struggling. So renegotiate, renegotiate, renegotiate. Now the key is, that sounds simple and straightforward, it was building the campaigns to get those tenants' attention and sharing sensitivity analysis with the landlords and the tenants to show a win-win situation. So that's how we survived that, that time in, in, the, in the 90s. But Bob, let's, let's move forward now. So we get through that. And then of course, just recently, actually last week, we all um, honored and remembered 9-11, uh, 18 years, unbelievable to think it's 18 years. But 9-11 happened. So uh, probably no greater market was there an impact than New York itself. Yeah, the 9-11 was a, uh, a very, very challenging time uh, in New York. Uh, clearly, it was, a, it was an absolutely horrific day here. Uh, and in the weeks and months after 9-11, uh, we saw many companies were laying people off um, of all types. These were um, uh, lawyers and accountants and brokers and financial analysts and people who were actually very, very well qualified. But there was just such fear in the market that many companies were downsizing. Uh, the volume of sales dried up. We had folks who were really nervous and property owners were selling their properties and saying, I'm going to go move to Iowa and live in a bunker. Um, and uh, it was very, very challenging times. Uh, but Paul Massey and I uh, felt like the city was strong and resilient and would bounce back. Uh, and so that was really a, um, a very critical juncture in the, the growth of our firm um, where we had, uh, we had 21 employees uh, on 9-11. And uh, we decided to go out and hire a director of human resources, uh, which we did. We brought uh, Gia Lamarca in. Uh, and uh, until then, Paul and I had been interviewing everyone ourselves. But we told Gia to go out and aggressively try to hire as many of these highly qualified people that were laid off uh, and bring them into the firm. We were going to grow our firm when other 
uh, companies were cutting back. And that might have been a crazy thing to do. Uh, it might have put us out of business under the wrong circumstances. But as it turns out, uh, two years later, we had 125 employees and uh, the market did recover uh, very quickly after 9-11. Uh, and by 2003, the market was really robust and moving forward, uh, and it turned out to be a very counterintuitive, uh, but a very uh, good move for us at the time. Okay, so I think one thing we could take away from that is number one, just like the stock market, you, you can't time the market. You just, you just, I don't care. You, you cannot, after years of investing, unless you feel differently, Bob, you can't time the market. But one thing you can do from a, from a real estate side and fuel all from your business side, when the market shows you whether tragic or opportunistic, whether it might be an opportunity for growth, you got to be in position to pounce on it. And so, Bob, you really risked a lot. It's not like you had hordes of cash ready to, to hire these people, correct? I mean, you took a risk. No, we, we, we absolutely, did, absolutely did not. In retrospect, uh, <coughs> it was maybe a... a a silly thing to do, um, but we just had a lot of confidence and we saw the quality of people that were out there. We brought some great folks into the company and, um, you know, as it turned out, it was a, uh, a good move to make at the time. Okay, perfect. And we're getting some really good questions. I got all your questions so far, folks. Again, the Q&A box, we'll get to these questions at the end. Please get to these market shifts. So now we've gotten and through. Rod, let me just let me interrupt for one second, Rod. I just want to make a comment on market timing. It's important. You, you never can time the market perfectly because you never know that you are at the top of the market until you're past the top of the market and the market's starting to decline. But what you do is you, you try to look at trends and try to see where you think things are going and just make your best guess at the time. You look at history study how history has trended, how different signals tell you that things might be about to happen, but it's absolutely impossible to time it right uh, and know that you did. It's only years later that you, you know that you were at the peak or uh, weren't at the peak. So uh, don't try to time it, just look for the signals that could be tip-offs that the market is changing in some way. Thank you. So let's move forward. Now, some of our younger audience, at least we had the internet by now, so they may be able to understand what this next event was. And certainly it happened in 2008, was the, just the beginning, but things got worse in 2009 and 10. So Bob, what happened during those years and how did you adjust? Wow, well, that's, uh, that was a tough time, obviously, with, with what happened in the uh, in the financial markets, the housing crisis, uh, everything that happened. And that's one of the difficult things about running um, a service business is that uh, volume of sales slowed down. So revenue slowed down. We had to let go 25% of our staff uh, to keep the business afloat. And uh, it was very, very challenging. Um, but when you, you see that volume is going down. You have no option other than to hunker down, uh, get back to the very simple blocking and tackling of the market, um, and just taking everything one transaction at a time uh, and trying to do your best to uh, do what you can to produce revenue uh, during those tough times. So give us an example when, <clears throat> how much in, because you talked about earlier in 93, you said actually you saw a decrease in volume if I heard you correctly, was almost 30% or was it 50%? It was 58% in the, during the SNL crisis from the, okay. the peak of the market to the trough. In the, the great hold on, recession, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everyone listening, Bob just did something. If you didn't pick up on it, Bob just did something to make it believable. Bob knows his numbers. He didn't say it was 30%. He didn't say it was 50%. He told me exactly what it was. So I'm going to, one takeaway, I know it's not the point of this session today, this is why I know Bob knows what he's talking about. He's giving me specifics. And how many of you guys use that? So Bob, take me now to 2008, eight nine. What kind of decrease in volume were we experiencing then? Okay, well, from the, the, the peak in, uh, in 2007 to the low point, which occurred in 2010, 
there was a 91% drop in the volume of sales in New York in terms of number of properties sold, 91%. I mean, it was, it was really horrific. Now, the, the value drop during the Great Recession was only 38%. It's funny to say only 38%, but compared <laughs> to the S&L crisis, um, you know, it wasn't that bad. But a 38% drop in value on a price per square foot basis. So, you know, the, the, the trough in terms of the low point in volume uh, was in uh, 2009. The low point in value was in 2010. And then things started to, to get better towards the end of 10 and into 2011. Um, but uh, definitely, uh, definitely tough times. Okay, so give me some of the ways you shift it with, a, with, with that much look. Now you're talking about 10% of the volume of normal. So how did you shift your approach, your campaigns, your, your processes? What did you shift in order to not survive but continue your level of being a market leader? Right. Well, again, we got back to uh, creating those uh, REO lists from the banks, working with the, the banks that were foreclosing on properties. And there were a lot of foreclosures at that time uh, because the diminution in value was such that uh, the equity in a lot of properties was wiped out. Uh, so doing a lot of bank work, selling a lot of loans, uh, we became very conversant with the uh, the loan sale business, uh, and we're selling loans for banks. In the during the SNL crisis in the early 90s, the banks were actually foreclosing and taking title to the properties and then selling them. Uh, during the Great Recession, uh, it seemed like the banks were more interested in selling the loans than actually going through the entire foreclosure process. So uh, the the whole way banks dealt with their issues. Uh, were very different during those two time periods. Uh, but doing a lot of work for the banks was something that um, was, uh, was critical uh, to making it through that point in time. Okay. So I'm hearing a lot of takeaways, which I'm going to summarize in a few moments. Um, but let's, let's continue down the path because it's been suggested that what happens in New York is, is maybe a hint to what's going to happen throughout the country as things go on because it's the mere volume of transactions that happen in New York compared to other cities uh, in the world. So what happened in 2015 that got your attention? Well, it was very interesting. I mean, if you look at the, the peak of the market, clearly 2014 and 2015 were the cyclical peaks of the market here in New York. In 2014, there were 5,534 properties sold, which was an all-time record by more than 10%. In 2015, there was $80.1 billion in sales volume. Uh, that also was an all-time record. Uh, but what we had seen is that in, in, the, in 2014 and for a good part of 2015, we had every demand driver uh, seemed like it was on steroids. Uh, we had the high net worth individuals and the local families were so bullish on the market, they were trying to buy everything in sight. We had more foreign capital coming into the market than we had ever seen. Uh, the Chinese institutions uh, were in the market with a vengeance. Uh, and everything just ran value up so high. And there was so much, um, so much land sold for new development. Uh, in 2013, 14, and 15, there was over 100 million buildable square feet of land sold uh, for both office, hotel, and residential construction. And we saw very, very tangibly that the market changed in very late September, early October of 2015, where almost overnight the market changed. Uh, we saw disruption in the hotel market. Uh, we saw a significant disruption in the land market, where uh, seemingly in a two or three week period, the offers on every development site we were handling seemed to be down by 20 to 25 percent. Um, we, uh, we have always been handling a very significant number of transactions. So uh, if we're handling 40 or 50 development sites at one time, you get to see those trends in a very pronounced way. So uh, when we saw this, there were a number of clients we had to go to and say, hey, we think the market has changed. 
Um, and we may have missed the market if we were just putting the, the property on the market. Said we're not going to be able to get the pricing. Things are, are different. Something is, is happening. Um, and sure enough, um, we think that real value went down in 2015. If you look at what happened in the land market, and land and hotels are very important because we think those are the two best indicators of market direction because they have the, the most correlation to uh, changes in the market. Hotels because leases are only for one day uh, and land because land is indicative of what developers believe market conditions will be like three or four years from today when what they're building is going to come online. Um, so when we saw that shift in the development market, we knew that value had changed. Um, in 2016, land values actually showed that they were up 6% in 2016. So a lot of, a lot of my clients said, Bob, you were wrong. See, value's up 6%. But what they weren't taking into consideration was that the volume of sales in land in New York City in 2016 was down 78%. And that's very indicative of what happens when a market changes. When a market changes, value goes down based on a disruption in fundamentals. And what happens is that most of the offers are coming in lower than expectation, and sellers simply don't capitulate. They just won't sell. So the few sellers that are able to get their price sell, so value appears like it's going up, even though real value is down, but the volume sales drops very significantly. And since the, the peak in number of properties sold in 2014 and the peak in dollar volume in 2015, both of those metrics have been, been falling and steadily falling even through this year for number of properties sold. There was an increase in the dollar volume in um, in New York uh, in 2018. We actually had in 2017, the volume had gone from the 80 billion in 2015 down to 36 billion. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, that rose up to 50 billion, uh, but we're back down to a pace that is gonna end up probably somewhere in the 30 to 35 million billion dollar range. Uh, and the number of properties sold is continuing to go down. And Rod, you had mentioned the disruption in the multifamily sector based on changes in the laws here. Well, let's, let's not get there uh, yet. Let's not get there yet. But I want to I okay. hear, let's, let's take this from 2015 to 2018. Let's take in that period. You've seen this right. drop in values, incredible drop in actual volume. Think about that. It actually went from 80, sorry, values, 80 billion down to 36 billion. Just think about that, that drop. Right, over 50% of your market gone as far as that's concerned. Now, how are you adapting during these years to continue to grow your business and grow yourself? How are you adapting? Uh, what are you doing different in the market now that you see this happening? Because it's not getting banking relationships. Those you don't, you're not there. We're not there yet. So, how are you continue no, to grow? No, that's, that's an interesting thing in this, in this correction. And as I said, we're we're four years into a correction here, which is a very interesting thing because the broader economy has been doing so well. Um, and that's important to note also is to look at things from a macro perspective and understand that uh, the recession in the early 90s caused major disruption in commercial real estate investment sales. Uh, the um, the uh, correction or the, the recession that we had in the early 2000s did not. Value went up every year in the early 2000s. So the uh, investment sales market here decoupled from the broader economy. Uh, in the 07 to 10 Great Recession, uh, they was highly correlated. And the, the recession led to a significant disruption in investment sales. So now we've had a, a time where we've had, uh, because of changes in fundamentals in commercial real estate, we've had a correction in the New York sales market with a very, very strong broader economy. So, you know, some people are talking about, well, what's going to happen in 2021 or 22? Are we going to go into recession in the broader economy? I'm not really that concerned about it because I think we've been four years into a correcting market here, and it's been relatively mild. It's been much larger on the volume side than the value side. Values are down uh, maybe 8 or 9% on average from the peak of the market. So we haven't lost that much in terms of value. 
uh, but we've lost a lot in terms of volume. If you look historically, these corrections last about three to four years. So we're already at what should be the end of the, the correcting market. And I think that if we didn't have the changes legislatively uh, that impacted the multifamily market, I think this market would be poised to start an upward trend again. Okay, so let's get to that. Let's go. Let's get to that. And you got you got to be succinct, Bob, on this one. A lot of people have no idea what's going on in New York right now, as it's going on in California in some areas, as it's going up in Canada in some areas as well. But can you just briefly tell us what's happened in New York, particularly to the multifamily asset type, with with this rent regulation? Describe it, and then let's talk about how we're adapting. Yeah, there, there is a rent regulation system in New York. Uh, that basically governs how you can uh, change rents in your building. Um, and units, apartment units that are covered under regulation have very strict guidelines in terms of how you can increase rents, what happens when an apartment becomes vacant. And these new legislative changes have basically made it a lot more difficult to extract market value and increase revenue in buildings. Um, it has caused a significant disruption, uh, and basically because of the disruption in value that we've seen, that's causing a significant uh, decrease in the volume of sales. Uh, we saw it in the, the months leading up to the, the law changes, which took place in, um, in June, at June 14th of this year, uh, leading up to the changes that the end. The changes were anticipated very significantly, um, so value has changed. And now, post new laws, uh, we've seen that um, the volume has changed. You know, it is is very very significantly off where it should be, and this is something that we anticipate uh, will uh, last for a little while, uh, simply because uh, again, it takes sellers. 18 to 24 months before they get used to the new normal in terms of value will start to capitulate. Uh, now there are some pending lawsuits that uh, are likely to lose in the New York federal court system. And uh, the plaintiffs are hoping to get it into the Supreme Court. But you're talking about years and years for that to happen. Uh, based on the diminution in value, it's likely that uh, folks may wait and hope that uh, the, the litigation is successful. So we're anticipating a muted volume within the multifamily sector, particularly the rent regulated multifamily sector uh, for some time now. Now, because I work with you, I know what we're doing about it, but do you wanna share about how you're adapting and changing and I'll, I'll chime in? Sure, well, the, um, with respect to the multifamily sector, buildings that are not subject to rent regulation probably are seeing a slight uh, increase in value today. So we're focused more, most of our prospecting in the multifamily sector is focused on buildings uh, that are not subject to rent regulation. Uh, and we're also increasing, you know, in, in uh, our practice here in New York, we're, we're generalists. We do all types of property sales. Uh, a big part of our practice is land. So we're, uh, we're doing a lot of, of land sale work and uh, focusing on that. But you know, you have to uh, fish where the fish are, as they say. So uh, when, we, when we know uh, that a certain sector is going to have a tougher time and, and a new sector um, or a different sector might uh, be more, um, more lucrative, that's where we spend our, uh, our canvassing time. So if I could chime in, everyone, so, because again, this transparent flow just joined us. Bob Knackle is a client of the Mosmo Group. In fact, he's the only client I personally coach. So I'll share with you what we do to adapt, right? Yeah, we find out where the fish are, as Bob said. There's ways to look at market data, look at trends, figure out where the fish are, create campaigns to attract those fish, chum the waters, if I may, right? Uh, that analogy got me there going, Bob. <laughs> so now right. we're chumming the waters, but also we're relying on the fact that Bob over years has consistently made sure his market presence is where it is. So if there is someone in that rent regulated building, we're not neglecting them, we're not ignoring them, but they know of Bob, they know what's going on. So if in fact there is a need, we know they're gonna reach out to BK. We just know it. 
because of the, the, the penetration and the presence in the campaigns we continue to put out in the marketplace. So yeah, you have to identify the trends, go from there, fish where you fish, create campaigns around your presence, and then tackle the, the opportunities that exist. That's how you have to need to shift. So here's, here's the rest of the call. We've gone on for almost 40 minutes now. We got about, we got 37 minutes. We have about 15 minutes left. So questions are fantastic. The questions, Bob, I don't know if you've seen them or not. They're really, they're going to help you all as far as responding to those questions. We're going to get to those in a minute. I'm going to share with you over the next three minutes, and I commit no more than three minutes, I'm going to share with you how you could potentially get with Bob, get with me and my team, and get prepared for 2020. So if I may, I'm actually going to share a website here right now. So I want to introduce you to a concept called CRE Ready 2020, and you can learn about that at CRE Ready 2020.com. If you're seeing this, you're seeing our live events, which we've held in Dallas, North Carolina, Los Angeles, and throughout, and they're always sold out. So this year we're doing it as big as possible. We're gonna work with 100 folks, just 100 folks. You must have at least five years experience to be considered. 100 folks we're gonna work with in customizing and building your own playbook for 2020. Bob's gonna be there, we're gonna have a couple of special speakers there. You can learn all about it at CRE Ready 2020. The things I wanna highlight for you is, yeah, we're gonna build out your prospecting playbook. You're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about for the first time, we're gonna share not only how we help our clients prospect better, Bob will share with you how he prospects. We're also gonna share with you some of our, which we never did before, how you build your presence in your market. Our methodologies we're going to share with you if you decide to invest in yourself and your business and join us in Orlando, Florida in November. Great time, by the way, to bring your family, if you wish, to go ahead and uh, have them go to the parks. Yeah, our certified coaches are gonna be there. So they'll be working with you to build out your playbook. And a couple of things I think are really cool is the one thing I wanna bring up, there's some great, great testimonials coming out of this event. They could be life-changing, they can be transformative. It can give you what you need, something you've never done before, to take the time, two days, to truly work in an intense workshop work with us and our coaches. And I gotta add one last thing, by the way, if you're one of the first, I think it's the next 30 folks to engage with us, we will actually pay for your hotel rooms at the resort. So if you decide to invest with us, you go to CREready2020.com and you want to invest in us, we'll give you a free hotel room if you're one of the 30 folks to sign up. Right now, all that's included and more, much, much more. There's a whole laundry list. I won't, I won't go to what it is, but the fact is this. We're also going to give you a discount code you'll get in the email later today or tomorrow morning where it will give you a discount on attending the event. So two full days with me, our certified coaches, Bob's going to be there, some of the top producers are going to be there sharing how to build your, your prospecting playbook and your playbook in general to attack 2020. We know it's going to sell out. This is the first public webinar after the summer, which no one ever pays attention. So if you're interested, you want to sign up, I suggest you sign up ASAP. Okay, that's my commercial. That's enough for that. Bob, do you want to, before I get to the questions, the questions are jumping in here, do you want to add anything about, because you've been to the event. In fact, you sat in the seat being a participant at the event. Anything you want to share about us getting together and, and, and what your insight is? Yeah, no, I just think the, the event is great. Uh, they're interacting with a, a lot of folks that are very passionate about the business, learning a lot. And I think, you know, one of the great things about this business is you can always learn more, no matter how long you've been in the business or how well you do, you could always do better. You can always learn more things. Um, and I, it's always been very rewarding for me. I love uh, sharing stories and uh, learning best practices from folks. And uh, I think that if you go, you'll find it very, very well worth it. Uh, it's a great time, meet good people. And uh, I still keep in touch with, uh, with several of the folks that I've met at these events. And uh, they're great, really great. And it's definitely worth your, worth your time uh, and your money to go and uh, expand your horizons a little bit. Well, thank you for that, Bob. And by the way, um, rumor has it, that, you know, we work our butts off at these events. It's a working event. But 
we've been known to have some some fun as well as prior attendees could suggest at the late nights with Bob uh, uh, events that we have in the town halls. Hey, I did forget though one thing. If you want to order right now, and if you want to be most people, use the discount code I M A M ready. I A M ready. I am ready, and that'll get additional discount code if you want to sign up uh, as we're talking. But don't go anywhere yet because I need you to get the answers to these beautiful questions that are coming in. So Bob, we're going to start at the top. You got a lot of questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you, because of time, I'm going to need you to spend no more than one minute answers on each of these, okay? You, you got it. Rapid okay, Bob, fire. here we go. I specialize in multifamily. This segment has gone from red hot to white hot to blue flame. I'd like to know, uh, SD, where are you, what market you're in? Although there seems to be a lot of artificial support in interest rates and high rents being achieved, what do you see moving forward in this shifting market? Now, Bob can only really talk about New York, but Bob, insights on the shifting market with this red hot, let's assume, let's assume, let's dream, Bob, that rent regulation never happened. <laughs> what would you be seeing? Yeah, I, well, I, I assume that based on the historical downtrend of the last four years that the market would be poised to increase. I think generally the multifamily market across the country is in good shape. Um, I think it will get better. I think low interest rates are a great thing for the market. Uh, it, 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 low interest rates are like jet fuel for, for volume. Uh, and high interest rates are not necessarily a bad thing. Most people believe that. I've always said it's not if rates go up, but why they go up, if they go up for the wrong reasons, like the U.S. can't sell bonds, or there's stagnation in the economy, or any, any number of reasons that would cause rates to go up, that is a very bad thing. But if rates go up because the economy is doing really well, we have tangible traction, job growth, wage growth, um, and all of those things are positive, then with increased rates, yes, you will get increased cap rates, but you will also have higher net operating incomes, uh, which can more than make up for the increase in, in rates. So with, with rates, look at why they go up, not if they go up. But the fact that they're as low as they are now is great. It's propping up the market. But, you know, they've been this low for 10 years. So, it, you know, for, for years, people were saying, well, rates are so low, they can only go up. Well, they really haven't gone up all that much. And that's been a positive thing. Okay, perfect. Um, they asked if you, why are you a generalist, but Bob, you're not a generalist. Uh, you, you may have said that, but in fact, you are truly a specialist. Can you define how, although you're a generalist, you're really a specialist? No, I, I think that I, when I say generalist, I mean relative to product type. I know most uh, commercial brokers who do investment sales do either multifamily or office or retail or industrial. Um, simply based on the density of the market here in New York City, where on one particular block, you might have eight different types of properties um, that we thought it been based on the size of the market, where we have 165,000 investment properties just in the four boroughs, not including Staten Island. Um, the city is way too massive. The geographically was the only way we could possibly attack it, especially when we were very new to the business. Uh, get to know a neighborhood, know it better than anybody, try to differentiate yourself that way. Um, that's what we did. So I'm a generalist in, in that fashion that I sell a number of different types of properties, but yet very disciplined in that I, I only uh, sell in New York. I only work on exclusives. I only represent sellers. Um, so there is a, uh, a very disciplined approach within a, a generalist strategy. And again, I'm not uh, doing mortgage brokerage or office leasing or anything like that. It's just strictly investment sales. Great. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, merger between JLL and HFF, how's it impacted your business? And how important is brand of the company you work for, for your business versus running your own firm? Great question because you've done both national and independent. Talk about that, Bob. Okay. Uh, well, the, the HFF, JLL, merger has been absolutely outstanding, fantastic thing. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, our platform here at JLL adopted a modified version of the, the old MK territory system with geographic experts 
Uh, the HFF investment sales platform here had product specialists. So we've layered the product specialists on top of the geographic specialists. And I believe we're offering a, uh, a service uh, that it cannot be offered by any other firm here. So I think that that gives us a competitive advantage. Um, the question of um, the big brand versus a uh, smaller brand, uh, I think there's room for, for everyone. Uh, and the smaller firms offer some advantages. The larger firms offer some advantages. At the end of the day, ours is a relationship business. Uh, and if you, if you are more disciplined uh, than others and you focus on the, the right skills within our business, uh, you'll form relationships that uh, will, will last uh, and be very meaningful and will allow you to uh, get the majority of assignments from a particular client. So I, I really think that um, if you if you focus on the relationship aspect of the business and having the discipline to actually do the things that need to be done, uh, sometimes people have asked me, you know, Bob, you you write articles about what makes a successful broker and tips for success in the investment sales business, and why would you do that? And I do that because knowing those things is not that special. Having the discipline to actually implement them is where 95% of the folks who know what to do uh, don't achieve the success that they could otherwise because it requires sig a significant amount of discipline to actually do those things day in and day out. Let me, stop, Bob, really no, let, me, let me stop you there because you're, you're going a little down a rabbit hole. I don't want to do that. I want to get to these questions. But one thing, let me add this to everyone. And this is really important. Bob, you, I think, Bob, you've heard me say this, Bob, and all the time spent together. When I first met Bob, Bob told me something that he's not in the commercial real estate business. He's in the information business. And Bob, publicly, for the first time ever, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. And I figured out why. And here's why. I recognize now this is true for every broker on this call, every agent on this call. <laughs> We're not in the information business. We're not in the commercial real estate business. We are all without a doubt today because of what's happening, we are all in the marketing business. And if you don't market yourself correctly and position yourself correctly, you will be a commodity. No matter how great Bob Knackle is, and he is the best of the best, he has full born presence initiatives going all the time. Because he wants people to know he's still here, he's still the top and he's there. What are you doing so I don't care if you're with JLL or ABC or Mazzy Knackle or independent, it doesn't matter so much so, how are you crafting your presence, your personal marketing brand? You are all a brand. Knackle is a brand. You mentioned Knackle, success, prestige, all that comes to mind. What happens when I mention your names of Smith or Jones or whatever, Massimo? You're a brand, don't forget it. You've got to have, you're in the, you're in the marketing business to get business. So. I'll get off my high horse on that one. Okay, how did Paul and you split the market in your early times? Did both of you work together on selling listed properties or do your own thing? Uh, at the very beginning, our territory, we each had a territory. They were side by side. We worked very, very closely together. When, when one of us uh, got a listing, we worked on it together. Uh, one was the point person and one was the guy in support. Uh, so we worked on those assignments together, but the responsibility for prospecting was very much independent. Uh, we had different territories. They were side by side, but um, from a prospecting perspective, everything was done separately. From an execution perspective, everything was done together. Perfect. Um, now, I love this question. Before I answer it, guys, there is no silver bullet. There is none. I think there's silver buckshot. A lot of little things you do consistently makes a huge difference. But here goes the one thing question, Bob. Bob, what do you do consistently in a good or bad market that, that will lead to business generation that you do on a daily basis? What is the capital letters, the one thing? <laughs> What's the one my, thing? My number one goal every week, and something Rod and I go over every week, is I have to speak to 50 property owners every week and eventually get around to asking them if there's anything in their portfolio they want to sell. That is, was, and always will be the number one thing that will drive the business. In a good market, a bad market, whatever, if you're not putting stuff in the front of the pipeline, nothing's going to come out at the end of the pipeline. 
And those calls are critical. It's number one important thing to do. Perfect. Love it. Uh, Bob, back to 2009-10 when the Great Recession was amongst us all and there was no velocity. How do you survive specifically? Did you and Paul obtain funding to continue your business or how did you do it? Yeah, well, we, uh, we tried to increase our revolving credit line. Fortunately, one of the things that helped us is we had very, very good credit. Uh, what I didn't mention is during those horrific times during the SNL crisis, we almost went bankrupt twice. Uh, we got through it by going around to every bank in town and getting a $2,000 card here and a $3,000 card there and had $60,000 worth of credit card lines that we used to run the business for, for, for a couple of years. Um, we had gotten up to uh, about a $2 million credit revolving line of credit for the company uh, that uh, we quickly uh, maxed out. And it was another issue we had to deal with, but always maintain good credit. That's a very important thing. Um, but the, the way we got through it really was uh, working harder. Uh, you know, during tough times, you make uh, an extra couple of calls a day. Um, send out a few more emails, do more blasts, write more articles. You have to, you have to really uh, put in more elbow grease when times are tough. Yeah, and I would even suggest, and thank you, Bob, you know, if you're home for the evening news, what's going on? You know, are you in a hobby or you own a business? Uh, most of your independent contractors, you own a business. So first of all, you shouldn't be watching TV, but that's on my pedestal. That's beside, get off that one. Okay. Yeah, Rod, Rod, we always used to say that to be successful in commercial real estate, you only have to work half a day. That's it. We don't care which, which 12 hours you work, as long as you're working 12 hours a day. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I know you know you, you just want dear to your heart. To create better sustainability and client credibility, do you advise in investing in your own or your client's commercial deals? Or is this a distraction from your brokerage income generation? No, I, I have never done it. I, I don't think it's a good idea to invest in your own market. Uh, that's, I, there are a lot of people in our market who are very successful brokers that own a ton of property. Uh, I happen to think it's a conflict of interest. Uh, I think if, if people in the marketplace know that you're an investor in properties, the first thing you're gonna, they're going to do when you offer them a property for sale is ask you, uh, if it's such a great deal, why aren't you buying it? Uh, so I think it's a conflict. We always wanted to keep our business very pure and conflict free. Uh, so we didn't do it. Uh, I admire the folks who are investors. I know it's a full time job uh, and we didn't want anything to ever distract us from uh, our brokerage business. So we never did it. It was just a personal preference. Okay, perfect. Uh, Bob, did you only focus on bank relationships for REO work, or was it a blend that of legal and servicer relationships uh, regarding how you got those deals? No, during during the uh, the SNL crisis in the early '90s, there were no uh, no there was nothing other than the banks and the RTC to deal with. Um, you know, this time around during the Great Recession, there were many different alternative lenders and servicers to deal with. Uh, for CMBS loans and things like that. Um, but we, again, based on relationships we had with banks, we focused mainly on just the banks. Okay. This is going to be a deep question, Bob. I know if you could say not my forte, then just say that. Do you think disputes with China will have a disruptive effect on the consistently well-performing industrial sector? Wow, we're on like, we're like on Fox News now. This is great. <laughs> do, do I think so? What in China? You think the trade disputes with China oh, trade dis will have a disruptive effect on a consistently well-performing industrial sector? No, no, I don't. I think that uh, what is being done now is the right thing we've been taking advantage of uh, for a long time. Uh, the guy who is the, uh, the trade czar uh, now is probably one of the uh, the, the best uh, trade uh, experts in the world, and I think that uh, all of this uh, trade stuff is going to be taken care of uh, within the next several months and will be a thing of the past. Okay, Bob, I believe you have a hard stop at 1 o'clock, am I right? Uh, we can go over if you like. 
Okay, okay. I just want to make sure I don't want to take, take your time. Okay. Um, how do you streamline finding, researching, development sites, ownership? How do you find ownership for properties? Um, the, the ownership records in New York City are fairly <coughs> transparent. Um, the, the publicly available data is probably 70 or 80% correct. Uh, we used that as a base and then uh, refined it to the point where, uh, you know, we have it highly, highly accurate. So it's not that difficult to, uh, to find the information uh, based on publicly available data here. I know that's different city to city and state to state, but uh, in New York, we're, we're lucky that it's uh, relatively publicly available. Okay, some of these questions are really, I can't, just not applicable to you, so I'm gonna pass on them. Um, what does a typical day for Bob Knackle look like? <laughs> Gosh, um, well, I'm, I'm an early riser. So generally I'm, I'm up about four or 4.15. I'm in the gym at 4.30. Uh, I'm doing emails uh, by six, or if I'm on the elliptical, uh, I can do some emails uh, while I'm working out. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, emails, you cleaned up, get into the office, and then uh, every day is different. Um, a lot of meetings could be on one day, another day I might have chunks of time uh, to make calls. Uh, I always make sure I allocate time for prospecting calls as well as marketing calls for different transactions I'm working on. Um, and usually uh, in the afternoon, um, you know, I'm trying to get those calls done, work on transactions, meet with folks. Uh, by six o'clock, usually I have uh, drinks with a client or a, a dinner with a client uh, or a, an event to go to. I always try to make sure I'm home by seven, seven thirty, uh, and uh, then spend some time with my wife and my daughter, which are they are my two priorities in my life. So I try to spend as much time with them as possible and uh, try to get to sleep by 10 o'clock. If I don't get to sleep by 10, I can't get up by four. Uh, so that's, that's pretty, much, uh, pretty much my day. Okay, I'm smiling, Fox. <laughs> I know the answer to this one, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Bob, do you have any tech hacks, tech hacks or automation tools that you use? Oh, I don't know what a tech hack is, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad I can get my cell phone on in the morning. And you know, this new email stuff is really great, and that's about my uh, my technological uh, aptitude. But but you all who's out there, the, the key is because you got to leverage others to do things you don't need to be doing. That's that's it. I mean, I have a team of forty now. Think about that. In the, in the past ten years, forty folks. Uh, that do several things for me. Yes, some 30 something coaches, but the rest operations. Bob, how big is your team? Oh, how big is my team? Well, I have uh, 14 people that, uh, that are on my team helping with the execution of my transactions. F fantastic. How about social media? The question came about how do you do social media? We know where you have Shannon and your team on your side, but you have a team that does social media for you? Yeah, I, I, I uh, apparently tweet quite a bit. I, I wouldn't know how to tweet if uh, if uh, I, I tried to, but uh, my my team sends out a number of tweets based on content. I do produce a lot of content, and um, my my team helps get that out. I write a weekly column for the Commercial Observer. Um, I'm frequently doing interviews and being quoted and things like that. And anytime that happens, that's being put out on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, Twitter and that kind of thing. But I, I spend uh, very little next to no time personally uh, doing any of that stuff. The team does all of that for me. And for that, those who are still on, I commit to you that during CRE Ready 2020, we're actually going to show you exactly how to create content and then to multiply that content and distribute that content to the marketplace. That's something we're doing differently this year. You never did that before. We're going to show you how to be a content creator, distribute it, and how to do it for various channels. So again, CREready2020.com, discount code I am ready. Okay, Bob, one last question. And what, then I'm going to have you close it out because I, I have some things I took away taking notes. Um, how often do you 
call per day. We know you make 50 calls. You have to talk to 50 calls uh, people a week. That's the goal. But how, how many hours? 50 connections. Are 50 connections. It's, it's important to differentiate. It's 50 connections, connections. not 50 calls. Right, right. 50 sometimes, connections. sometimes I can get 50 connections and 75 calls. Sometimes it might take 400 calls to get 50 connections, but it's 50 connections is the key. How many times I dial the phone is irrelevant. Okay, perfect. Here you go. Uh, I'll give you my takeaways, Bob, first from this meeting, and then I want you to close it out with your takeaways, and then we'll wrap it up. Is that fair? Sure. Okay, here's the notes I took during this call. I, I hope you all took notes. But here's what I understand. When it comes to market shifts, this is where the keys were. Number one, which to me was a golden nugget. Now, do you all know the land and hotel trends that are going on in your market? Because according to Bob, those are key indicators to what's coming up, right? Like, am I develop a hotel or develop the land? How long will it be that it comes up? Hotels are one-day rentals. A lot of insight to seeing where the market is shifting. Do you know those numbers? Yes or no? If not, figure them out. Look at market shifts. And then use that messaging to your audience through content, value-added content, to show you're a thought leader and be there when the market shifts. Absolutely. Um, do you have the relationships with banks today? Could you say, if the market crashes tomorrow, do you have the relationships with the banks? Because like they say, don't dig your well when you get thirsty. That's a Harvey McKay line, right? Do you have those relationships today? If not, what are you doing to get those relationships to create that market presence? Again, we're in the marketing business. Create the market presence. Are you prepared both financially and emotionally for the next market shift? Bob's got tough skin because he's done some things of getting credit cards for $2,000, $3,000, right? He's been through there. He knows when the market shifts again, and we all know it will, it could be, could be another 2008, 9, 10. Hope not. Could be worse. Could be. We don't know. But are you ready and prepared financially and emotionally to make that happen? Are you committed to your business? Bob, share with us. Look, when things went down. 2001, right? September 2001, market completely shifted talent was available, he was so committed to what his craft was of commercial real estate, he went all in. How committed are you? And part of that, of course, is do you have the confidence to do it? Bob was confident enough to say, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good that I could get through this. Are you in position today to have that confidence going into 2020? Are you? Are you in position to have that confidence and commitment to get ready for the shift may happen? That's where you got to get to. So when the market comes up, not only do you survive, look, a lot of folks survived, a lot of folks didn't with the Great Recession, but also you start to thrive. Bob has created a position of being a market leader. Attaining that position is hard. Look at the road he took. Maintaining the king of the hill is harder. And yet Bob does it every day by working his ass off and doing the right things. So that's how we get prepared for market shifts. BK, give me some final remarks on market shifts and moving forward. No, I think the, the bottom line, Rod, is that it's so important to, um, to not only uh, do your, your business on a day-to-day -day basis, but to not get so involved in the deals themselves to lose sight of the big picture. So take a step back and look at what's happening in the market. Look at trends, look at things that will impact what happens with volume, uh, what's happening with values, what's happening with fundamentals, what, what does supply look like in your market, what's happening with interest rates, what hap what's happening with employment growth and wage growth and different things in your market, what zoning changes may affect things. Always take a step back and try to connect the dots between everything that's going on in the world around you and how the market's reacting. And if you see those changes or can predict those changes before other people, it gives you a leg up on adapting to them. Uh, you, you'll be able to impress your clients with the fact that you, you saw it coming. Um, and uh, Rod, I always love the, the analogy that you use with me that uh, Tiger Woods would be standing on the, on the tee box and there was no wind at all, but yet he could look down the fairway and saw the wind coming up, <laughs> up the fairway and would adjust his, uh, his shot based on that. And, you know, look, look for the wind. Look for the wind, even though you don't feel it. And um, 
that, that can be very, very beneficial for your career and can help you get through tougher times. And uh, again, I, I, I always say this to folks, coaching is a great thing. Uh, when I met Rod, I had no idea that a broker coach even existed. Uh, he was working on uh, one of his books, uh, interviewing me for that book, and um, got to know him, got around to asking him what he did. I was shocked to hear that he was a broker coach. I, I didn't know such thing existed, uh, but it, it's changed my life professionally. It really has um, no, uh, no secret sauce, but a number of things were very eye-opening to me. They seemed very obvious, but yet I wasn't focused on them. Uh, and, uh, and just having someone to instill the accountability and the discipline in you, uh, to do the little things and the big things, uh, that have to be done every day, every week, every month to achieve your goals is so important. And it's, uh, it's really been a great experience for me. I, I hope to be doing this for another 20 or 30 years. And if that's the case, uh, uh, Rod will be my coach for those uh, those 20 or 30 years, but uh, I think self-improvement is something that uh, you can never underestimate the value of. Uh, always try to get better, always try to learn, um, and, uh, you know, I think all of those things, if you focus on them, will serve you very, very well. Well, thank you so much for the, the kind words, Bob, and more importantly, thank you for your insight and your sharing with us today. I know folks are excited to come see you in Orlando and you'll share more on your prospecting and your presence. So uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to post this on our Facebook group, on our, uh, our general and social media. So folks who get to hear this again, of what Bob said and share it with, please share it with your colleagues to get ready for the next shift. My friend, yeah, my client, I get that. But my friend, my colleague, and, and certainly one of my confidants, Bob Nackle, I can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Rod. Anything for you, my boy. Okay, guy. Everyone else, let's move forward. Don't forget, CREready2020.com. Use the discount code IMAMREADY and join Bob and I in Orlando in November. We hope to see you there. Everyone else, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>